Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so today's session, we're going to be going through a spouse client file from start to finish. And it's going to be a really open ended session. So you can feel free to jump in anytime when you have any questions, you can either unmute yourself or you can send it through the zoom chat. So hopefully everybody can see my screen right now. And this is the screen that you get to when you first log into the system. It's gonna list all of the different clients that you've added in. So to add a new client, you're just gonna go over to this add button. And then the key details you're going to need to put in for any client are first name and last name. So today we're gonna to call the client Ben Collins. You can put a middle name in as well if you have it. Then this email field, this is here if you want to send this client the online questionnaire. And the online questionnaire is basically like an online intake form. It gets all of their information on their profile, family tree, asset, and debt. And basically what happens is you put in the client's email, you, quest, uh, you, you click this use questionnaire box, and then when you add them to the system, it sends them off an email that says sort of click here to access your questionnaire. So they click on it and then it takes them to create a password just so that all of their information stays secure and so that they can come back into it. So they don't have to enter in everything all at one time. They can come back and add a later date and add some more information. And then basically they go through the questionnaire. So they put in all their profile, asset, debt information and anything they fill out in that online questionnaire, you're going to see automatically in your system when you go into their profile. But you don't have to send the questionnaire. So you just wouldn't need to worry about putting their email in and don't click this use questionnaire box and then it won't send them anything. And you can use whatever you use now, whether it's sort of a manual form like a PDF or Word document that you send them or if you wanna go through it throughout the meeting with them, you could do so on your end. You don't have to send yourself the questionnaire. So that's what that part is. And then the, the part at the bottom is contributors. And that's just if you're from a bigger firm and you've got multiple users on your account, you can sort of pick and choose who is going to be uh, allowed to access the file. If everybody's an admin on your account, which I'd recommend if you're not worried about restricting access to everyone, admin doesn't mean that they're necessarily an administrator it just means that they're going to have access to everything in the system. So if you're not worried about restricting, I would just make everybody an admin uh, to make things easiest. But then whoever set as the primary contributor here on the file, if you do choose to generate a cover page, then this is the name that will generate on that cover page. And you can always change it by selecting someone different. And then let's go ahead and add Ben Collins to the system. And since today we're doing a spouse client file, you need to add both spouses as separate clients in the system. So if you were just doing one of their wills and the other was a beneficiary in that will, you just had to add one of them and you could add the spouse to the family tree. But this is if you're doing wills for both of them, then you need to add them both as separate clients. And then we can link them together so that we'll be able to sync some shared information. So we go back up to this add button and then first name, let's call her Lauren Collins. And this is the key thing right here, this spouse client field. So you can only do this when you're adding the second spouse to the system. So you add the first spouse to the system normally. And then when you're adding the second one, you click on this spouse client and you pick the name of the first spouse. So the reason you have to do this on the second spouse is because you need the first spouse to be in the system so that you can select their name from the drop down list. And now, because they're linked together, it's going to mean that all of their shared family tree information, joint asset information is going to automatically populate in both of their profiles. And then as well, you're going to have the option to sync each scenario and the appointments over if it's going to be like a mirror will situation. So then we'll go ahead and add in Lauren. And now both Ben and Lauren are in the system. And so you have to decide who you're going to start with. So today, I'm going to pick Ben. And so to get into a client's profile, you're just going to click on their name, and it's going to bring you in. And so if I had sent that client the questionnaire, and they'd created a 
huge family tree and put in all their assets, I would see that when I went into their profile. But if I hadn't, so today we didn't send the questionnaire to the client, this is what I'd start with. So because it's a spouse client file, I start with Ben and Lauren. And usually what I do first is I edit the client's information. And there's two ways to do that. You can edit whoever the blue circle is around and click this edit button. But what I usually do is just double click on the icon you wanna edit, and then it's gonna bring up more information on the side. So the key things for anyone on the family tree, you're gonna to wanna to make sure first name, last name, and the gender is filled out properly, just so that the wording of the will comes out as you would like it to. This also known as field, if Ben is also known as Benny Collins, you can put that in and it will populate in the will. Date of birth, you can pick it from this little calendar, but I find it easier to just type it in like month, day, year. So if it was June 7th, 1970, for example. Country of birth, you can pick a country, you can pick citizenship, you can do multiple if you want. And then all of this other information, this is just good to have on hand. So it's good information to have on the client, especially uh, for like law pro purposes. Then you're gonna click on residency. So residency is important as well because however the province is set here is how the probate tax is calculated throughout the system. And if you're a lawyer that's not from Ontario, this is how you sort of choose which precedent you want to generate. So right now, aside from Ontario, we've got precedents for uh, Nova Scotia and BC. So if you change the province to either one of those, it would generate a Nova Scotia will or a BC will instead of an Ontario will. But the default is whatever your residency is um, as the user. So I'm in Ontario, so my default is Ontario. City is also important. So if you want it to say Ben Collins from the city of Toronto in the will, you're going to want to make sure that city field is filled out as well. Then we'll move to, to special circumstances. So special circumstances here for the client is a place where you can note any potential capacity issues. So again, good information to have on your file, especially if you suspect there might be some sort of challenge to capacity, you've got good notes. So you could click off that button and write a description in below and all this information will populate in the profile summary. So you'll be able to have that on your file. And the last thing is just direct relationships. So it's gonna list everyone that you're tied to on the family tree. And then we'll go ahead and save. So next, let's say we wanted to add a child. So whoever the blue circle is around is who you're adding to. So if I wanted to add Lauren's child, I would click once on her icon to get the blue circle around. So if you double click, it's gonna bring up all of that information. But if you just click once, it gets the blue circle around them, and then you can add through direct relationships to them. So now it's back from Ben. Let's say I want to add Ben's child. So I go to the Add button, click Child, and then it's going to ask me who the other parent is. So I've got some choices here. I can say it's Lauren Collins, who's the current spouse. I can say it's a new parent, so an ex-spouse that's going to be involved in the will. Or I can say none, a single parent. So either it's an ex-spouse that is not going to be involved in the will, not in the picture, or they genuinely are a single parent. So you've got those options. I'm going to just pick Lauren for today. And then you're going to enter in the child's information. So again, the key information is first name, last name, gender. You can put date of birth in as well. It's June 7th, 2000. And then if you scroll down to the special circumstances section, this section for anyone that's not the client is a place you can note relationship difficulties, but really the most important part of this section is disability. So if the individual is disabled, you're gonna to wanna to make sure this button is clicked off. So that way the system can pick up on that. And later on, if you're drafting um, a, a, a trust that has trustee's discretion to duration to death of beneficiary, it's going to know that you're trying to set up a Henson Trust and it's going to draft a Henson Trust clause in the will accordingly. So you have to set that they're disabled here so the program can pick up on that. Then we'll go and add. 
So you might notice if you go to your ad list, there's no option for grandchild or niece and nephew, but there's still a way to get them on the family tree. You have to do it through direct relationship. So instead of just adding a grandchild directly to Ben, what we have to do is add a child to Ben and then click on that child's icon and add a child to the child. So now we're gonna go add child. We're gonna say he's a single parent. And now we can enter the grandchild's information into the system. So that's how that works. Same thing for niece and nephew. You would click on Ben's icon, add a sibling to Ben, and then click on Ben's sibling and add a child to the sibling. And that's how you get niece and nephew in. But if there's gonna be anybody else that's involved in the will in either a beneficiary or a trustee capacity, but they're not family, you're just gonna go over to this other tab over here. And then you just click add person. Let's say later on, we know Jordy's gonna be a trustee of this will. So we're gonna say Jordy, Aiton, you can add the relationship to the client, you don't have to. And then we'll change his gender and go add. So that way their information will be in the system. And then later on, you'll be able to choose them from the drop down list because they will be in the system. So that is people. Does anyone have any questions before we move on to the next section? So you can either just unmute yourself or you can send it through the chat if that's easier. Nope. Okay, don't be shy if you do. Um, next section, we'll just click over here. You might be able to see it if your screen is bigger, it'll always just be on the side. And then we'll go over to assets. So for assets, you're always gonna start with the general personal effects, just to remind you to gift them to someone in the will. So you're triggering that special general personal effects clause. There's a couple of different things you can do in the assets section. So if you wanna sort of use the program to its fullest, you can add all of the client's assets in with the values at this point in time, and you can get a sense of sort of the net value of their estate for now and sort of what's going where, and you can really plan it out well. If you're doing more of a simple will and it's pretty much just dealing with residue, you don't have to add every single asset in to generate the will. We can just divide up the residue once we get to the scenario section. But the key thing for assets is any asset that's going to be a specific bequest, or if you want registered assets either con confirmed or to do a new designation in the will, you have to add them in this section because they have to be in the system in order to be able to gift them or redesignate them later on. So let's just add a couple in now. So we'll start by adding a bank account. So first you select your sort of category and then your type within that category. And then we'll go select. So the asset name, this is really the most important field because it's going to be how the asset is referred to throughout the system and in the will if it's going to be a specific asset bequest. So for something like a bank account, maybe I'm adding in two or three bank accounts. If I don't change the asset name, they're all gonna be called bank account. And it's gonna be kind of hard to tell which one is which bank account. So I like to put all the identifying information right in that asset name field. So maybe it's the RBC bank account, account number, whatever this number is. And that way, if I add the RBC bank account and the CIBC bank account, I know which one is which and I can differentiate accordingly. So the asset name field is really key. If you're putting the balance in, let's say it's $100,000, you're going to notice that the probate tax is calculated for you. And it's calculated based on whatever you had set the client's residency as. So mine is calculated according to Ontario law. And let's just say that the bank account is solely owned. And then we'll go ahead and add. Next, let's go to real estate and add a home. So again, if this asset is going to be a specific bequest, maybe I want it called the family home. Maybe I've got a lot of homes uh, for some reason. The address field will also populate. So if the address is 123 Anywhere Street, that will come up in the will too. Again, I'm gonna put the current value in, say a million dollars, the probate tax will calculate for you automatically. 
And another key thing to note, whenever you're adding real estate, you're gonna have this mortgage slash encumbrances field here. And if there is a mortgage on the property, I'm gonna put the value of that mortgage in this field because not only does it have an effect on how much probate tax is calculated, but it also helps to know what sort of debt this asset is associated with. Um, you also have the option to add a mortgage in the debt section later on, but if it is associated with a specific asset, I would put it in this field instead, just because of the implications. The one thing is make sure you're not putting in a value here and adding a mortgage in the debt section because then it will double count it. So best practice is to just leave it out of the debt section and just put the value in here if it's associated with a specific asset. Then we're gonna scroll down. Let's say this is owned jointly. So we're gonna change sold to joint and then we're gonna remember to add the other joint owner in. So if you've already added this person to the family tree or the other section, avoid this little person plus button. All you have to do is click right on that text that says add owner, and then you're gonna pick who the other joint owner is. So it's gonna be Lauren, the spouse. Then we'll go ahead and add that home. And because I marked that asset as joint with Lauren and I joined Lauren and Ben together at the beginning through that spouse client function, that family home is automatically going to be in her profile as well. So to see that, if I wanted to switch over to Lauren's profile, all I would do is I'd click up here on Ben's name and I would switch over to Lauren. And then it shows me that family home that I just added to Ben. So let's add one more asset to Ben. I'm gonna go back to the add button, scroll down here and go RSP. So again, I would change that to identify it better. Maybe it's the RBC or RSP with that number. This beneficiary field, this is just for information, whoever the current beneficiary is on the policy. So later on, you'll have the option uh, if you wanna confirm that beneficiary or if you wanna do a new designation in the will. So this is just for information who the current one is. Current value, let's again, let's say 100,000. So you notice the probate tax always calculates, but the income tax doesn't. And this is just due to the variability of different clients' tax brackets. So if you're going to put in an income tax number, we usually like to sort of show clients just an estimate on the high end of the highest possible tax that they could incur with this asset. So for something like an RSP, I would do 50% of that. So I would put in $50,000. If it was an asset that had a capital gain, I'd do like 25% of that gain as the income tax value. And that way you're sort of showing clients an estimate. We're not tax experts, it's just sort of showing them what they could be looking at. Then we'll go and add. So that's the asset section. Does anyone have any questions about this section? Nope, remember, just feel free to unmute yourself or send it through the chat if you do have any questions. So the next section we can go to is debts. So this is more for a planning purpose. It doesn't really have too much of an effect on the will itself. You just go to the add debt. I would not put that mortgage in again because we already put it in on the asset and I don't want it to double count. But let's say they had a credit card debt. So I'm gonna say credit card thousand dollar balance and add. So next we're going to get to the scenario section and this is where all of the planning occurs and basically the idea is that at most you go through these three scenarios and create plans for each one of them so that your bases are covered no matter what ultimately ends up happening. So you'd start with surviving spouse, you'd create a plan for if the spouse is still alive when the client has passed away. Then you go to descendants only. So this is what happens if the spouse and the client are gone, but they have kids or grandkids around. And then lastly, no descendants. So this is the situation where everyone's gone. It's kind of like your ultimate disaster, what's happening to the estate. So at most you plan for all these three, depending on your client's situation. If they didn't have a spouse, didn't have kids, you just had to plan for the one. 
it's, it's at the most you do three. And basically you start by clicking on the scenario and it will bring you into the system. And then you can start planning. But today I'm gonna to show you how, if you're doing a typical situation, you can do it a lot faster. So instead of going into the scenario and creating the whole plan, once you've filled out the people, assets, and debt information, you can just go up to this little lightning bolt button over in the top right. And these are all the e-plans that we currently have available. So it's basically a plan for a typical situation that will go through all of the scenarios and the appointments section and sort of give you a head start. So we'll either do the plan for you if that's exactly the plan you were looking for, or it will give you a good starting point. And then you can go in and make the changes that you need to so you're not starting from scratch. So if it's a typical situation or if anything kind of matches what you're trying to do, it's a good place to start because then you don't have to start from nothing. So I'm gonna look through and see if any of these meet what I want to do. So let's say I like the idea of this spouse with younger children to distribution trust. So in the surviving spouse scenario, it's telling me that the, everything is going to go to the spouse absolutely 100% and it's going to make the spouse the primary estate trustee. In the descendants only scenario, it's going to give everything to the children in a trust, in a two-stage trust, 50% at 25, everything else at 30. And then in the no descendant scenario, it's going to give 50% to siblings, 50% to spouses, siblings. And so I like a lot of this one, but I might wanna make a few changes. But first I just start off by executing it and it's gonna run and it's going to go out and fill out all the scenarios and appointments for me. So now when I click on surviving spouse, it's not empty anymore. I can see something's been done. And first of all, in the joint designated assets section, it's going to pull any joint assets or designated assets and give it over to the spouse automatically. So this is good. This is, means these assets are falling outside of the estate if the spouse is alive, and that's exactly right. So it's done that section for me. In the initial gifts, it's going to gift those general personal effects to Lauren because it's going to gift those general personal effects to the spouse to make sure that you're generating that special general personal effects clause. So that's good as well. And then the balance of the estate just says segment one. What, what does that mean? So basically, if I click on this gray bar and click on it again, it's going to tell me the details of the gift. So it's an absolute gift to Lauren, 100%. There's no gift over because the second scenario is a gift over, so we don't need to put anything here. And this looks good, so I don't need to make any changes. So the surviving spouse scenario, if it's a typical situation, it's going to go absolutely to the spouse. I don't need to make any changes here. Then I'll go to the next scenario. So I'll just click up on surviving spouse and go to descendants only. Probably not any joint or designated assets because we're in the second scenario, but for initial gifts, it's going to have gifted those general personal effects to the children, which is good because it's going to, again, generate that special general personal effects clause. But just to show you how you do it manually, I'm gonna remove it. What you would do is all of the assets that you've added to the system, they're going to appear over here as these green boxes. Then you just pick the asset. So I'm going to pick general personal effect and drag it over here. And then all you have to do is click on this beneficiaries line and I could pick the children and name them specifically, or I can scroll down and pick the class of children instead. And then I just click add and that's how you do it manually. Then the last section, the balance of the estate. So again, I'm just going to click on both these gray bars to sort of see what's happening here. So it's doing a trust for the children. 100% same trustees as the executors. The duration is going to be when the beneficiary reaches age 30. Let's say, no, I wanted it when the beneficiary reaches age 25. Stage lump sums. So I'm going to change this as well. So at age 21, I want them to get 25%. So I've made some changes there. Then the gift over that comes with the e-plan is first to beneficiaries issue. So if they have kids, 
and then if not, to the other class members, so the other children. This looks good, so I'll press save. And now it's made that change to the trust that I did. And if I also want this change to be reflected in Lauren's will, what I'm gonna do is click this special spouse sync button up here. And basically it's gonna copy everything I've done in this scenario over to Lauren's profile as well with any changes that I've made. So I'm gonna click here and press sync. Then we're gonna to go to the last scenario, no descendants. So right now with the e-plan, it gives half to siblings, half to spouses siblings. But let's say this is not what I wanna do at all. So if you didn't even want to plan for this scenario, maybe it was a really huge family, probably not going to get to this point, you just press clear and it's going to get rid of that. And then you'd sync it over to Lauren. But let's say I want to do a special plan. I want to give 50% to Jordy and 50% to a charity. So I'm going to do this manually by adding segments and creating gifts within those segments. So segments basically divide up the estate. So I'm going to start by creating my first segment for 50%. Now that I've sort of divided it up, I have to say what's happening with this piece, essentially. So I just go to the Add Gift button. I'm gonna pick Jordy as the beneficiary. Maybe I'll add a gift over to his issue, and then I'll add. So now you can see the, the little green circle in the middle is 100% of this 50% we've dealt with. So I don't wanna add any more gifts because I've already dealt with everything in this 50% segment. I need to go back to segments, which is this little grayed out segment button right here. And then I need to add another segment because I still have got 50% to deal with. So I'm gonna go add segment, add gift. If you've already added the charity to the system, you can scroll down and pick it from the list. But if you haven't, just go to these three dots and say new charity. And we're gonna say Epilepsy Toronto because Purple Day is on Friday, Epilepsy Awareness Day. And then for the ID, don't worry about it because it won't populate. But if you do happen to have the CRA number, you can just type whatever it is on this line and that way it will come up on the will as well. We'll go ahead and add. And then if I wanna copy this over to Lauren, this no descendant scenario, I would click her sync up in the top corner and it would sync this one as well. So that scenarios, um, it can get a bit complicated at some times, but does anyone have any questions about this section? No? Okay. Hi, yes, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. I do have a question. Yep. Hi, um, so let's say, um, I don't know what scenario would be relevant in, but under the assets, like for the um, descendants only scenario, you only moved in uh, like one of those little green sections under assets, like you only did the general personal effects what do you do like should you move the other ones or um, how do they get dealt with if you wanted the other ones to be specific asset bequests so if you wanted to specifically give this family home to the kids or something like that you would drag and drop it over but anything that's left over here will just automatically fall into the residue so it won't be named specifically in the will but you'll know that asset will just automatically end up in the residue okay thank you no problem Perfect. So then we'll jump to appointments. So this is where you're going to put in your estate trustees and your guardians. And because we ran that special e-plan with the lightning bolt, it's going to put the, oh, I have another question. If the RSP is listed as an asset, but there is a named beneficiary and you name it in your data, will the probate fee recalculate and not show up here as part of the residue? So if you name it on the assets tab, it doesn't affect anything. That's just for information. But if you wanted to note that it had a uh, designated beneficiary, let's say in the second scenario, it has a designated beneficiary, you would just add who it was. So let's say it's John. And then you would just drag and drop this over. And then it would, if you wanted to see the implications on the tax, you just click over 
on here it says summary and it will show you any implications uh, based on how you plan. So if there's a designated thing, you'll see that probate tax was saved because we marked it over to the designated beneficiary. So on, yeah, on the, in the assets section, when you're adding in that beneficiary in that field that has no effect on anything, you have to actually drag it and drop it into the joint designated assets section in the scenarios in order for it to have that effect on the probate tax. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, yeah, so back to appointments. So this is going to be, yeah, where you put your estate trustees and your guardians. And the e-plan is going to have that spouse be the primary estate trustee. But to add any alternates, you just go to the add button. We'll pick your alternate. You can also pick trust corporations. And for the will, it will generate their specific trust company clauses. So that's kind of cool. And then condition. If you wanted Jordy to be a joint primary state trustee with Lauren, you'd select none. So if you put a condition none, they're going to be primary. If you put any conditions on it, they'll be an alternate. And I like to pick if all specified cannot act as the alternate. Uh, and then I just need to make sure the specified is the right person. So specified Lauren, that's right. So it'll say Lauren, if Lauren can't act, then Jordy. And you can add multiple primaries, multiple alternates, just by playing around with the condition. And the sync button is actually down here in the bottom corner instead of the top. And you just press sync and it'll copy these appointments over and it will switch Lauren and Ben's name so Lauren's not her own estate trustee. And guardians is just over here if you want to put those in. And then lastly is provisions. So the first thing is funeral arrangements. So if you want those to populate in the will, you can just type them right on the line. So if it was be cremated. But if you don't want this clause to come up, just delete this text and there will be no funeral arrangements clause in the will. Include future members is if you are using class gifts in the will and you want in, in, to include future members in the definition of that class. So let's say children, for example, I gifted to the children in the second scenario. So in the will, it's going to say, my children are John Collins and any other child born to Ben and Lauren kind of thing, instead of just my children are John Collins. Class restrictions. So you can include posthumously conceived children or children not born out of wedlock in the class, um, depends on what you wanna do. Trust for beneficiaries under a certain age. So this is your general trust clause and it's gonna guide underage beneficiaries that you haven't set up specific trust for. Um, so if it goes through a gift over to a grandchild and they're underage, it'll just be governed by this, but it won't affect any trust you've set up in the will already. And then this last thing is secondary will assets. So this is if you're doing primary and secondary corporate wills, then you can sort of pick and choose which definitions you want included in the secondary will. But if you're just doing a single will, like we are today, you don't need to worry about clicking or unclicking anything. It won't have any effect on the single will. You can just leave it. So that's provisions. Then I would go up to this little exclamation point. And these are what we call advisor insights. So it's basically like a checklist based on what you're putting in the system uh, that will advise you on certain planning things. So if you're putting in like underage beneficiaries or disabled beneficiaries, it's going to give you more alerts so that you don't miss any important planning for those kind of specific groups. It'll also note if you've missed something. So here I didn't put in Lauren's gender. I could always go back, put it in, and then this alert would go away. But not all the alerts go away. Uh, some of them will be here, like this one is always here. But it's more just to make sure you've checked through everything and you, you know you've thought about it, um, just so you can be more confident in your plan. It doesn't have any effect on the actual will. So if you have some here, it's not going to not let you generate the will or anything like that. It's more just for your information. Beside it is this little notes function. So here you can make any notes on your client. Maybe you want to note that you had to check the spelling of a name or that you'd done a title search on a property. You could just put that in there. 
And then the last button is this little download button. And this is where you're going to generate your summaries and your documents. So the summaries first, there's three. The first one's the profile, and it's going to give you all the information that the client has put in their questionnaire or that you've put in for them, like we did today. So profile, family tree, and all of the family members' information, assets and those details, and debts. So this is great to have on your file. Maybe you even want to give it to the client after the meeting so that they can check the spelling of names and asset details, make sure everything's correct. Then the next thing is the scenario summary, the graphic scenario summary. So this is really valuable if you're putting in specific values on assets because it can show you for each scenario what the rough net value uh, of the estate is at this point in time and what's going where. So this can be cool, it's a nice visual. And the last one is the text scenario summary. So it's gonna give you essentially the will without the legalese. It's just got all of the information for each of the scenarios, what gifts you've created, who the beneficiaries are, all of that stuff. So it can be like a more digestible form of the will so clients really understand sort of what they've done with their estate plan. So those are summaries. Then you can go to documents. You might get that little message depending on what plan you're on. If you're on a trial, you can disregard it. Um, and it's going to list all of these documents. These are all the documents you can currently generate with the system. And we're going to start with, we're just going to do a single will today. So you click single will, and then you've got some more options. You can change the signing date if you want to a different date. You can take it out and put it in manually in the document later. Registered asset designation. This is if you want those registered assets either confirmed or to do a new designation in the will. You're going to want this clause. But if not, you would just uncheck that box. Joint designated asset confirmation. This is if you're dealing with like um, a client that has a lot of joint assets with adult children. This will say that anything that's joint is truly intended to be joint, not held on a resulting trust. Counterpart execution. That's if you're signing in counterpart under the new legislation. Simplified provisions is a shorter will without less definitions and less powers. So if you're doing a really simple will, um, it's not no trusts, anything like that, you can generate this one, it'll be shorter. Will guide is a nice little table at the end of the will that will guide the client to the clauses in the will. And the cover page is a cover page. And then for the witnesses, you can pick anyone else who's a user on your account. But if they're not a user, you can just click this blank box and you can enter their information in manually in the actual will. And then you just click on generate and then it will give you a Word document that's fully editable. This is a, a bit of an older one, so you don't take that time to generate. Um, but you'll start with the funds and plans. So that's if you click that registered asset box to confirm or do a new designation, it'll have this clause. Assets passing outside of the will. This is if you click that join asset box, it'll have that button. Here's all the definitions and interpretations. So my children, um, I didn't include future children in this one, but if you had, it would change this definition of children. Here's the appointments to Lauren. If not to Lauren, then Jordy. Here's your funeral arrangements clause. So if you didn't want that, just delete the text in the system and it wouldn't come up. Here's the special personal effects clause. So if Lauren, if not to Lauren, then to John. Sometimes this general personal effects clause will generate with a little red sort of highlighting. And that's just because it wants to draw your attention to it because you have to make a decision if you're gifting to children whether you want the division of those personal effects to be at the trustee's discretion, or if you want to implement some sort of lottery system. So you either just leave trustee's discretion and take out ABC, or you leave ABC, depending on what you want to do. So that's why that red highlighting is there. Here's the residue to transfer to Lauren. If not to Lauren, then this special trust for the children. And then at the end, half to Geordie, half to Epilepsy Toronto. And I'm going to just scroll all the way to the bottom. 
here's our little will guide for the client. So it's just a guide to the clauses in the will. You can choose to include it, but you don't have to. And that's basically how you'd go through it. Um, one other thing I just want to point out is this little question mark button up in the top corner. So if you're ever stuck, you can always email me or support, and I'm happy to jump on a Zoom and help. But another good resource is this question mark. So if you click on it, it'll bring you right over to our help desk. And here's you, you can search for anything, like how do I do a Hanson Trust? So if you search Hanson Trust, then it's going to give you a step-by-step. -step. First, make sure that that disability tab is picked off in the people section. Then when you're creating the gift, make sure that it's death of beneficiary, uh, unlimited discretion for the trustees. And then it's gonna draft that Henson Trust Clause. So this can be a good resource, this little help desk, but you can always email me uh, as well if you ever get stuck. So that is sort of how you'd go about it. You'd then switch over to Lauren's, go through hers to make sure you hadn't missed anything and generate uh, her will as well. And that's, that's sort of the process. So before we wrap up, does anyone have any specific questions about anything? No questions, okay. Um, but if you do come across a question later, you can definitely just email me. And if you're ever stuck, I'm always happy to jump on a Zoom and help you through it. Uh, so I just like everybody to, um, thanks again for joining me today. And I hope that everybody has a great rest of your day. Thanks guys.